Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me okay? Well, good afternoon and welcome to our Town Hall on Electoral Reform. I'm so, so pleased to see so many of you here. Let me just start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people, unceded territory, and those uh, First Nations are currently represented by the Esquimalt and the Songhees Nations. I'd also like to say it's just astounding to me how in Victoria we can get a crowd like this on a sunny Saturday afternoon at the end of the summer, especially when I hear that there's a beer fest just down the street at the Royal Athletic Park. It's incredible. That's real dedication. That's real devotion. Uh, and I'm also so pleased that we can meet here again at uh, Vic High. I was talking to my colleague, we'll introduce in a moment, Nathan Cullen, who tells me that this is one of the, his favorite venues in the entire country, and he's been around to, to a lot of them, so I know what you mean, Nathan. We've got three special guests with us today, uh, and I'd introduce them from my left. This is Abigail Eisenberg, professor and chair of the political science department at the University of Victoria. I'll be introducing each of them a little bit in a bit more detail later, but to give you a sense of our cast of characters. We also have next to her, Terry Dance Benink, who is the Victoria, with the Victoria chapter of Fair Vote Canada. And lastly, my colleague, Nathan Cullen, Member of Parliament for, Bo uh, for Bulkley Skeena Valley. Now, today's gathering is the beginning of an important conversation that Canadians must have, and one that has to happen in our community as well. And that's about the way in which we can change our electoral system, how we elect representatives at the federal level, and we hope eventually at the provincial level as well. Our current system is called First Past the Post, and it's been uh, around since uh, this great country of ours began in 1867, 150 years almost ago. Now that's only a few years older than Vic High that was founded in 1876, so uh, uh, even Vic High is getting a seismic upgrade sometime soon, so maybe our electoral system needs a bit of a push as well. So it's really time, we think, that Canadians come together and figure out if we can put a better system in place to, represent, to uh, vote for those who represent us. One that better reflects the values and the diversity of this great country and also reflects the votes of Canada to make sure that every vote counts and to make sure that our democratic institutions and local concerns are, and values are reflected in Ottawa more, more faithfully than perhaps they have been to date. We want a, a system as well that is understandable and accepted by Canada and encourages people to vote. Now, we're meeting in a high school and it's a matter of great I think concern to many of us that so many of our young people are turned off our system. They don't think their vote counts, why bother going to the polls? So I think it's really critical that we get more people of this age demographic engaged in our democratic system. Some of the reform proposals you'll hear about may well achieve that result. So I've got two goals for, for today's forum. The first, as your MP, is to make sure that we have a well-informed conversation and that's what our panel is here to do. Secondly, I want to hear from you. Now, we won't be able to hear from every single one of you in this room today, but I hope that we can hear from a lot of you after the panel presentations. And there'll be, of course, great opportunity for dialogue from the floor. There are also other ways for you to have your say. Uh, first, a survey is being handed out at this forum. If you didn't pick one up on your way in, please do so, so we have your views. There'll be volunteers in the room to make sure that you get one. Uh, I think that's, anybody got a survey they could hold up to show? Yeah, so if you, there's a Josh's in the back and others, make sure that you get one of those and we very much welcome uh, your input. We will collate that information. Secondly, please mail or email my office at any time to give us your views. I've been getting a lot of mail, a lot of emails, a lot of regular mail on this topic, which is great. Thirdly, we're, we have the Special Committee on Electoral Reform that's taking submissions from you, the public, until October the 7th of this year. So please get engaged. You can make submissions online or you can mail them in. Nathan will have more to say about that in the next short while. Um, and so the Special Committee, as you may know, is meeting right here in Victoria on September the 27th to hear local views, to hear your views on what they should do. 
And so we don't have the details yet as to just where that'll take place at what, and or at what time, but the 27th is certainly the day and you'll hear more details later. Certainly my office will give them to you if, if they're not well, uh, well, well available in the media and so forth. So let's get started. First we'd like to hear from Professor Abigail Eisenberg. Now Abigail uh, is uh, an uh, incredible uh, a scholar. She is the chair of the political science department at the University of Victoria and she has had a distinguished academic career in both teaching and publishing before coming to UVic as an associate professor. She was at the University of British Columbia before that, has had fellowships at various institutions including the University of Edinburgh, the Université de Montréal and universities in Italy and Spain which is pretty cool. Her research is focused on the status of ethnic minorities, indigenous minorities, and national minorities in Canada and internationally. I've asked Abigail to set the stage. Abigail. in 50 minute increments and we don't really want that going on today. Uh, how's that? Is that better? Okay. So um, what I'm going to do or what I think the, the, the one way to set the stage is to think about what we're worried about. That is, what is the problem that changing an electoral system is supposed to fix? And so in thinking about that question, which is also a question that the Electoral Commission is concerned about, um, there are lots of problems we can talk about. I'm going to talk about three problems. Uh, one you've heard of called the democratic deficit. Uh, the other is uh, concerns people have about uh, maintaining clear lines of representation between voters and the people they elect. And the third is that the system, whatever system that you have, cannot be confusing. Uh, it cannot be corruptible. It has to be, it has to have integrity. So those are the three uh, concerns that I think a lot of the other concerns fit into. So let's start with the democratic deficit. Uh, you've heard this term, I think, before. It's a term that is uh, discussed widely in Western democracies, uh, in all Western democracies. It usually consists of two problems. One is voter participation rates, uh, and the other is the way in which electoral systems can distort uh, the, the uh, number of, there's a distortion between the who we vote for and who the parties we vote for and the parties that end up uh, uh, occupying seats in the House of Commons or the Legislative Assembly. So let's talk voter participation. Canada has a not such a great voter participation rate. Uh, it hit a low about two elections ago at 58%. Uh, we've climbed up uh, to 68% in the last election, but it's not great. Now, in this respect, if we compare Canada to other Western democracies, we find that, you know, regardless of the electoral system, uh, the participation rates have gone soft. Uh, and that is true for uh, systems that are uh, first-past-the-post systems, like our system is. It's also true for systems that are multi-member proportional systems, like New Zealand or Germany have. Uh, it's true for all the systems. We see that in some of the systems, places like New Zealand and Germany, which are interesting systems because they have this multi-member proportional system that's favored as one of the electoral systems that we should change to, their voter participation rates started off at rates, I mean, what's distinct about them is they start off at 95 and 90%, but they've slowly gone down as well to 70%, 75% uh, in New Zealand. What does that tell us about voter participation? Is, is there any relation between voter participation and the electoral system? Well, I think the answer is that there is a relation. But an electoral system is not going to be a magical transformation in terms of voter participation. It, is, it has to be viewed as an in ingredient 
that allows parties and political leaders to tap into other ways in which we can encourage people to vote. Now, I say that because when you look at the second problem that's associated with the democratic deficit, other than voter participation, when you look at that distortion effect that some electoral systems have, there is just no doubt that some electoral systems really distort the relationship between the percentage of uh, votes that a party gets and the percentage of seats that a party gets. Um, it is uh, absolutely the case that the first pass the post system is the worst in terms of distortion of all the other systems. Uh, it's, and it, first past the post ends up having two kinds of problems that if you're a voter, if you voted and followed elections, it, you are familiar with this pro these problems. One is the wrong winner problem. And that's a problem when the party with the most seats is not the party that has the largest number of popular uh, of votes. So we have that problem, we've had that problem in BC in 1996 when a party that won the most votes did not win a majority of the seats in the Legislative Assembly. But it's a real problem also sometimes with minority governments. So they'll get the most seats in the House of Commons, but they actually did not get the most votes. That's a rare problem, I must say. It is a problem with first past the post, but it doesn't happen very often. The problem that actually happens often under first past the post, and it really distorts um, the uh, representation, the system of uh, uh, the relation between voters and seats, is what we call the exaggerated majority uh, problem. And that problem is, again, a problem characteristic of first past the post. Uh, it tends to over-represent the party that wins the election, and it underrepresents all of those parties that have significant support but less support. So, for example, in the last election, we see, I mean, we see this in nearly every election, by the way, in Canada. Uh, the Liberals get 54% of the seats, but only 39% of the votes. The New Democrats receive 13% of the seats, but 20% of the votes. So here, the, the party that gets the majority uh, has less popular vote than they do seats. The party that has a smaller percentage of the votes gets way, way less seats. And that's because in some constituencies, uh, nine electra, uh, voters can give the winning candidate 90% of their votes. But only one person gets elected with 90% of the votes in any constituencies. In another constituency, voters might give someone 35% of the vote and they will get elected. And so when you add the math up, it ends up being that there's this distortion effect. In some constituencies, as we know, or for some of us as we know, uh, we stop ourselves from voting for candidates who are members of parties that we think are not going to be uh, one of the two top parties within our constituency. We stop ourselves because we feel that our vote is going to be wasted if we vote for that person. That's the nature of our system, uh, uh, creates this problem of wasted votes in this sense, and it's because it's a winner-take-all system. Uh, those people who vote for candidates or parties that do not win that do not win at the constituency level, their votes end up counting for nothing. And so you have this distortion effect, you have underrepresented uh, parties uh, where people, sometimes millions of Canadians, a couple million Canadians will be voting for a party. They will receive zero seats in the House of Commons. And in other cases, of course, 35% of us are voting for a particular party and they're getting 70% of the seats in the House of Commons. So that distortion effect causes a lot of cynicism about the, especially the first past the post system. What about the other systems in this respect? Well, any system that has a proportional aspect to it will not, will be able to uh, address that kind of distortion system. So a straight proportional system, of course, would do that. You'd have a party list, everybody votes, 60% of us vote for party A, you just go down the list, 60% of the seats in the House of Commons are occupied by that party. 
That's not a credible system probably for Canada for reasons that I'm going to talk about in a second. But some of the other systems, multi-member proportional, STV, the famous STV, both of those systems do not have this distortion effect, or they can be set up so as not to have that distortion effect. So in terms of, that's the democratic deficit part of the uh, uh, set of concerns. What about the lines of representation, which is the second set of concerns that Canadians have, tend to have, about uh, their, um, their electoral system? So representative governments are, of course, important. You want clear lines of representation. You want to know who you're electing. You want to know who you can call when you have problems. Uh, also in Canada, geography is important. And so it ends up being the case that we're never going to have a system that does not link, or I don't think we're going to have a system, it wouldn't be a good idea to have a system, that does not link representation to our distinctive geographical locations. We're very regionalist, we have differences um, uh, in the country, certainly, along geographic lines. So how do each of these systems do in this respect? Well, first past the post is great in terms of geographic representation very clear lines of representation between voters and elected representatives. In fact, the system is designed for that purpose. The problem is, is that it represents nothing but geography. Uh, and it overrepresents geography in a way that causes problems with national unity in this country. So first of all, first past the post exaggerates support for parties in certain parts of the country and encourages parties to focus their, their energy in some regions and to ignore others. So if you are a party and you have to decide how to distribute your resources, you're going to distribute them within constituencies where you think you can have an edge, where you think you can win. And that means when you have the distribution of 338 seats in the way we do, that sometimes it's just worth your while not to put a lot of resources into particular regions. Uh, the con Conservative Party is known in Canada to be the party of the West and Ontario because it focuses its energies on winning electoral seats in those constituencies. The Liberals have traditionally been viewed as the party of Quebec, uh, partly because they make sure they can, they can win Quebec and in the last election, Atlantic Canada. Parties that end up focusing on broad-based concerns, concerns that are not easily spun into regional concerns in the country, end up not winning seats in constituencies. It's in a party's interests to spin everything, from the environment to foreign policy, from daycare to women's rights, into a regional issue. Uh, and that is a product of the first-past-the-post system. Uh, so, because it, it's the other thing about that aspect of it, the, lo, local, the clear lines of representation, is that because parties, because we're all focused on the constituency level and winning these geographical local constituency uh, elections, uh, it discourages parties from nominating candidates who might be risky. And who, which candidates might be risky? Well, anybody who is not safe and who is not going to be appealing at the local level, anybody who's going to be edged out. A lot of people connect that, and I think rightly so, to the fact that we have a terrible representation of women in our parliament, uh, that in a sense the status quo is to elect men. We do not have good representation of, of uh, ethnic minorities, visible minorities in our par parliament. We do not have good representation of indigenous people or people with disabilities. And that's because it's a great risk for the parties to end up fielding candidates where they think that just because it's just sort of small prejudices that people have, that those people might be edged out. They might not be viewed as safe. Great example of this, by the way, is in the last elections. The Liberals uh, did not mount more women or ethnic minorities than they have in the past or uh, at all. But after they were elected safely uh, away from uh, the uh, uh, from the voters, um, at least from the voter from from the voting box, from the ballot box, they made a big deal out of putting a lot of women and minorities in their cabinet. Justin Trudeau did. And what was interesting about that 
is that a lot of Canadians were extremely happy that he did that. He got a lot of good press by that, and especially the younger than 35 crowd. So the younger than 35 crowd thought that that was just fantastic. So it's attractive, but it's not attractive to the broad base in the same way. And it's certainly not attractive when that has not been the way in which status quo politics has, um, has, been, uh, uh, has been followed in the country. Okay. Um, Finally, let me just say something about transparency and uh, integrity, ensuring transparency and, and integrity. Um, oh, and by the way, just with respect to local representation, one of the great things about some of these alternative systems, and one of the things I think you, we should look at, is that some of them retain the geographical focus, but then also have this other focus that allows for non-geographic representation. And certainly that's true of the multi-member proportional system, that it has a non-geographical component, but it also very much keeps to a geographical component. We elect people exactly as we have, and most of the people will be in Parliament if we had that system exactly in the way that they are now. But then there's another question. It, it augments that with a list system that we get to weigh in on. Okay, so finally, in terms of ensuring transparency and integrity, uh, first past the post is supposedly great, um, I should say. Get a ballot, you know exactly who you're voting for, that it, it, they're counted very quickly compared to other countries. And in those, in those that's actually quite important um, to uh, the transparency and democratic, you won't, you don't want to be in a system where you have to take like a political science class in order to figure out what, uh, how the electoral system works as much as I want anybody, everybody to be taking political science classes. Uh, but I think all of the systems can be explained. I don't think that the electoral, uh, the electorate is, is stupid. I think it, we can all figure it out. And to tell you the truth, if we can figure out first past the post, uh, we can figure out any of these systems. Uh, but all the systems are pretty transparent and pretty good. Some of them take longer to count, if that matters to you. Some of them offer us more choice on the ballot, uh, if that matters to you. Uh, I think Nathan's going to be describing some of these systems, and, and, and that actually becomes an important uh, aspect to it, too. So, um, let, with that warm-up, I will turn it to Terry, who, for fair hope. Thanks very much. That's great, Abigail. Democratic deficit, distributional effect, clear lines of representation, transparency and integrity. I got the big picture, I think, right? That's exactly what we asked Abigail to do. Thank you so much. Now I want you to hear from, uh, from Terry, Terry uh, Dance Bennett. Terry's on the board of the local chapter of Fair Vote Canada, an organization that's been working uh, for years on changing our electoral system. And she's been active, I've met her often in wearing her environmental hat. She's an environmental activist in our community, working as well with faith organizations and has done for most of her life before settling here in Victoria. Before that, she was an educator and vice president academic of the Sir, Sir Sanford Fleming College in Ontario. Thanks for being here with us, Terry. I'm honored to be here today and would like to start maybe a little bit on a different tack, which is I want to share my own personal reasons for championing electoral reform and then conclude with a few highlights from Fair Vote Canada's submission to the Parliamentary Committee. And just in case you don't know, Fair Vote Canada is a national organization. It's volunteer driven, 99%. Uh, nonpartisan, and it's grassroots and has about 66,000 supporters now and 40 teams or chapters across the country. So I'm quite proud to be associated with them. But first, my disclaimer, I'm not an expert like the other folks on this panel. Uh, I'm an ordinary citizen, I'm a woman, I'm an environmentalist, and most of all, I'm a voter who cares about democracy and civil discourse in our country. How many of you can relate to one of those labels? Hands up. <laughs> I'm not alone. 
Um, I grew up in the 60s in Ontario, and I was actively involved in the movements for peace, for women's rights, and racial equality, as I'm sure some of you were, judging from the number of gray hairs. And eventually, though, I had to earn a living, and I spent most of my life, as, as Murray said, as an educator and ended up in the college system. And as such, I could not engage officially in political activity. And in fact, if I'm honest, after my 60s activism, I became quite cynical about politics. But since I retired to Victoria 10 years ago with my husband, I've sort of come alive again. You know, that's the joys of retirement. You can be free to be who you really want to be. And so I vote for the best, most qualified candidate, not always from the same party. I voted strategically in the last election to ensure that the uh, incumbent government was not re-elected. But I dislike this pressure. I don't want to have to vote strategically. And I'm sure some of you also feel the same way. And as Abigail said, I mean, I was shocked after the election to realize that nine million voters in that election have no one now to represent their views in Parliament. And that only increases cynicism and disengagement. The one thing I am happy about, though, is that 63% of those who voted chose parties that committed publicly to making sure every vote counts in 2019. So that kind of cheered me up. And that's why I've gotten involved with Fair Vote Canada about two years ago and became personal friends with Wendy Bergerud, who was the president of the Victoria chapter at the time. And I think many of you know her for her incredible leadership of the BC Citizens Assembly. Um, her husband, Bill, where are you? Wave your hand. I know he's here. There he is, is with us today. Unfortunately, Wendy died of cancer last March, much to our great sadness. Otherwise, she'd be standing here. And just before she died, she asked me to get more involved. And so that's why I'm here. And that's why you saw a lot of other Fair Vote Canada volunteers. We are carrying Wendy's baton. So why do I wake up at night worrying about electoral reform? And I do. I know I'm a worrier, but anyway. Um, first reason is climate change. That is my biggest, biggest worry, and I think there's a direct tie-in with our voting system and the issue of climate change. One and a half degree global warming, expanding fossil fuels don't mix. Oil and water, right? And I think most of all, I'm fed up with playing jack in the box. Does anybody here remember that game as a child? You know, it's a box that has a puppet that jack that jumps up and then you slam the lid down. Shows my British roots, probably. So first we have Enbridge pops up and we slam the lid, or so we hope. Then Kinder Morgan pops up and BC's mayors slam the lid, along with two thirds of BC voters in repeated polls. But who's listening? Then LNG proposals start mushrooming in BC, one right in our very own backyard, namely the Saanich Inlet. And we mobilize again to slam the lid. The Site C Dam pops up at the same time. And if it proceeds, it will cost taxpayers $9 billion at least. The beautiful farmland will be flooded that could feed a million people, and First Nations rights are infringed upon once again. So I don't know about you, but I'm getting dizzy. I'm getting tired of constantly, you know, fighting these issues. How do we stop floods, droughts, fracking-induced earthquakes? It's not with our majoritarian first-past-the-post system. Like you, I endured 10 years of a climate-denying federal government, that won with 39% of the vote and had all of the power. And we have, in fact, if we're honest, a similar situation today. 
just with the liberal government in power, albeit with a stronger stance on the climate, which has, we are waiting to see the acid test on that. I go back to sleep, remember I'm waking up at night worrying about all this, because I know now, having worked with Fair Vote Canada, that there are 90 countries in the world who have a better climate record than we do. Why? In large part because they're using a proportional representation system to elect their national assemblies. And it's no accident that they're responsible for a shrinking share of world carbon emissions and that they score six points higher on Yale University's Environmental Performance Index. So if we had a system of governance like these countries do that truly represented all of our collective voices, we'd have a democratic way to curb oil and gas interests. And that's why I'm so keen on electoral reform, because I see it as a long-term solution to recurring short-term crises. It's time for Jack to stay in the box for good. Secondly, <laughs> as a woman, Abigail mentioned this, you know, I am really upset that only 26% of our parliamentarians are women. That places Canada 62nd in the world, well behind Angola, Belarus, Iraq, South Sudan, and Afghanistan. I mean, can you believe it? And my heart goes out to all the women that I knew in the South Island that ran for office in the last election, poured their hearts out, and got defeated. But I sleep better at night when I remind myself that women in these countries that have PR fare better and are not penalized for running for smaller parties, which many women choose to do. Dr. Joanna Everett, who's the Dean of Arts at the University of New Brunswick, says that if Canada switched to a proportional voting system, our percentage of women would vote, would increase by 10% in the next election. If we stick with what we've got now, it will be 100 years before we approach gender parity. And I don't know about you, but to me that's totally unacceptable. On the first past the post, you only get, thank you, you only get to vote for one person. And that's part of the problem in a riding. And that person, sorry Nathan and sorry Murray, tends to be white and tends to be male. <laughs> but they're good champions. <laughs> But under PR, you can have candidates, several candidates in a district, working together in a team with an open list ballot. So it's in the interests of parties to put forward multiple diverse candidates. And because PR involves consensus building and compromise, I think these are qualities that many women uh, gravitate, gravitate to more than the aggressive one-upmanship of first past the post. We prefer to give and take rather than take all. And lastly, I'm a woman of faith and hope. And it's not just because I'm a member of Esquimalt United Church and a Buddhist Sangha. Um, I'm drawn to a positive vision of the future, not one of fear and division. The US uses a version of first past the post, and you just look at what's happening south of the border. I mean, I can barely stomach to turn the TV on at night. But we also saw echoes of this in Canada last year and in Toronto. But fortunately, we voted against it. Fear is a terrible motivator. And so again, what puts me to sleep, would you believe, is watching Nathan. <laughs> and 11 other MPs <laughs> via CPAC um, as part of this special parliamentary committee, I have watched nearly all of the 23 sessions. You know, you can watch it live, you can go in and watch it later, and I have felt so encouraged. 
You know, we were even able to tweet. We could tweet Nathan, and he'd, he'd raise our tweet. Um, and what's impressed me is the quality of the 50 plus witnesses that have come from all over the world, unbelievable people, you know, speaking from actual experience, and the level of friendly, healthy debate within the committee. It's not like question period. And the other thing that struck me in listening to these is the fact that Canada, since 1977, has had 13 separate electoral reform processes many of them citizen-led, at both the national and the provincial level, including BC, Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, Manitoba, and PEI this October. So I believe that surely we can say yes to what they have all recommended, and they all did, citizens-led, expert-led, they all recommended some form of proportional representation. We don't need a referendum. We've done our homework. Just, just a few quick points on Fair Vote Canada's stance, and you can go to our website and read all about it. We support the five principles that our Minister for Democratic Institutions, Mariam Monsef, has outlined, namely, we want to see a proportional system that's effective and legitimate, number one, engages voters, accessible and inclusive, has integrity, and guarantees local representation. We may have to rank our priorities, and I think that's the purpose of the survey that you've received, because there's no perfect voting system that's going to give us everything on all five of those values. At the top of my list, our legitimacy, inclusiveness, and local representation. And I'd like you to maybe think about what's at the top of your list. Lastly, people have asked me whether Fair Vote Canada supports one particular uh, version of proportional representation. And you know, your eyes can glaze over when you start talking MMP and STV and AV. <laughs> and I just want to be clear that Fair Vote Canada has uh, in its brief has identified three broad models. One is mixed member proportional that's recommended by the Law Commission of Canada in 2004. It's recommended by the NDP and it's used in many jurisdictions in the world. The second one is single transferable vote called STV which many of you are familiar with because it was recommended by our own BC Citizens Assembly and approved by 58% of the voters in that first referendum. And it's used in Ireland and in Australia. And then the third model is a new one, a hybrid, called rural-urban proportional that combines elements of both MMP and STV. And it's a, it grew out of the uh, former electoral, chief electoral officer, Jean-Pierre Kingsley's work, and People from different camps have been working on it to ensure greater proportionality, so I urge you to take a look. Fair Vote Canada doesn't endorse any one of those three, okay? We trust the committee to do its work. Um, we believe that we can have a Made in Canada version. Our bottom line is that we must choose a proportional system using ranked ballots alone in single member districts called Alternative Vote doesn't cut it. I, for one, don't want to have, I don't want to have my second choice or even my third choice candidate as my MP. I think we can do better than that. And AV also tends to favor big centrist parties at the expense of the smaller parties. So I'm looking to the parliamentary committee that Nathan is vice chair of to reach a consensus. I know that's a huge challenge, but we've got to get it. As they listen to the experts, they do all these consultations, and they look at our own history, that they'll come up with a sensible solution this fall. Thank you very much. Wow, that was excellent, Terry. That was just superb. You know, 
I, um, I really appreciated how you personalized it and talked about it from the, con from the context, among others, of environmental consequences and uh, gender consequences. And I just want to say as a shout out to David Murner, who I saw come in here earlier. David, where are you? I I saw you here. There he is right there. David and I were just on a panel this morning and he made a comment uh, about the implications of proportional representation for female voting and it was a statistic that just I could not believe. Afghanistan has a better record of women in their democratic assembly than Canada does with their PR system, which is quite shocking when you think about the consequences of being a woman in that country. So I really appreciate that, that comment and your personalizing it the way you did. Now our last speaker is a good friend of mine, and I have to say, Terry, he's never put me to sleep. And, and that's, uh, that's, Nathan, that's Nathan Cullen. Now, <laughs> if any of you know Nathan Cullen, putting you to sleep would not be high on your list of descriptors for Nathan Cullen. <laughs> Uh, Nathan has been crisscrossing this country from coast to coast, speaking at forums just like this on, uh, uh, on the need to address electoral reform. He's on the special committee on electoral reform that, as I said, will be back in our community on September the 27th. Now, his riding is a little bit bigger than mine. I can bicycle across mine in, I don't know, a few minutes. Nathan's is larger than Poland to give you some idea of what it's like to be an MP in his riding of uh, Skeena Bulkley Valley. He's been the NDP spokesperson for uh, democratic reform and, uh, and environment. And I said he's been very, very active on this electoral reform agenda. One of the things I'm very proud of that he was able to uh, convince, I think is the right word, the federal government, the current government, to adopt his proposal on the structure of the Electoral uh, Reform Committee so it reflects the proportion of votes in the last election. I'm proud of Nathan for a whole bunch of reasons because that's high on my list. Welcome again back to Victoria, Nathan. It's working now. Look at that. I won't use my uh, schema voice now. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you for those amazing uh, presentations. I'm just going to talk in monotone so that Terry can catch a few Z's <laughs> and, and not raise my voice or gesticulate at all. I am so glad that the House of Commons Committee is performing many functions. Um, <laughs> one of which is helping people get back to sleep who are tossing and turning, worried about electoral reform. Now, uh, you all have a problem, obviously, um, because you're here on a uh, sunny afternoon while there's a beer fest going on. The, the minister, uh, Minister Monsef, uh, we hosted her in Kitimat, BC, just a couple nights ago, and she used the term uh, democratic geeks people who are really, really into this. And it is an addiction, and we may all be in a, in a, in a, in a group right now, a, a helping and caring group to help each other out of this addiction. And I think one of the ways to do that is to have a system that we no longer have to concern ourselves over with being so broken, a system that was invented in the 12th century that can't possibly handle 21st century challenges and problems. And that is the historical moment we have in front of us this incredible opportunity to talk about, and in Canada's soon to be 150th year, this wonderful gift of real and representative democracy for this beautiful country of ours, where every voter, regardless of where they vote and who they vote for, will not only have their vote counted, but have their vote count towards something meaningful, which is their voice and representation of Parliament. That's the goal. No pressure. Because these windows, as we all know in politics, only open so often, and only open for so long. And we have this unique moment, and I give the Liberal government its due, that it not only campaigned on making 2015 the last election under first past the post, as we did, as the Greens with Elizabeth did, but now we have a process in front of us that may allow us to get there. That's good because there's often times when parties get in and certain promises they made in the campaign, they say, well, people didn't vote for us on that one. 
or this one's complicated. Maybe, maybe we meant the next or the next. And my experience is that without a deadline, uh, not much happens in our parliament. If, if you think glaciers are slow, <laughs> watch parliament act without having something that they have to actually meet. And we have ourselves now an incredibly ambitious deadline to meet. So maybe we can, we can tack into this. And the happy news is that much of what um, has been said uh, it covers what I was going to say. So as, as we sometimes did when we were in school, they stole my answer uh, on a bunch of this, but it'll help us get through this faster. And what I'm imagining, I know we have a roving microphone as well, and some music to go along with our presentation today. Um, that there may be some questions that pop up, that are really burning, I don't understand what you just said, or I just really disagree, or there's another piece. We'll try and adapt as we go to make sure that this is more conversational than just one way. And we'll see how that goes, okay? So, first thing is, we are, this is the agenda that I've been using in some of our town halls, but we'll speed through it a bit quicker today. Um, talk about what the problem is, as, as Abigail has already done. Talk about what promises have been made. The committee itself, the values we operate under, and then walk through a couple of these systems that we've talked about without going into too many of the systems. A real danger in this topic is you just start to dive into the weeds. Versions of versions of versions of electoral systems used in the uh, upper reaches of Bavaria in 1605 was really... It, it is the number one recipe in politics and community dialogue to just shut people out of a conversation. A lot of this conversation, as has been described, is about values. What do you care about? What do you care about most? And how do you build that into the DNA of a new way to vote in this country? So, let's crack ahead. Um, the problem, as has been well described, we have false majorities. We have been using this system for 150 years, which was created very well for a two-party state. Two-party democracies can function under first-past-the-post with relative ease, because there's only two choices. The problem with it is, is these false majorities. As has been well described, you end up with about 40% of the vote, as Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Harper before him did. Translates into a little over 50% of the seats. And under a Westminster model, a prime minister with a majority government has an inordinate amount of power. For those of you that have studied this or thought about this, the UK prime minister, the, the, the US president, the French prime minister, None have as much concentrated power as our Prime Minister does under a majority system. It is a lot. And even with the most benevolent, well-intentioned people in the world, that much power in the hands of an individual or the Prime Minister's office, which is often the surrogate, is a problem. The appointment of Supreme Court justices, the control and running of all the House of Commons committees, on and on it goes. And over time, I don't know if you've noticed this, but governments rarely age very well. They are not a fine wine. <laughs> Over time, the, they start to get a bit sour and a bit more sour and more insulated and more insulated from their own voters, never mind the broader electorate. Particularly, as Abigail pointed out, when we have a system that puts that regional differences on steroids, that there is a great incentive to focus your issues on particular groups of voters more and more narrow and ignore everybody else. It also creates massive distortions, as we've seen in our election system time and time again. I would argue that first past the post, the winner-take-all, majoritarian, those kinds of systems, also create a great incentive to not be very nice to each other. Because there is an advantage in tearing down your opponent at a personal level. I don't mean just going after their worldview and the way they think about a certain issue. I mean in that very vindictive, personal way. And if you want to talk, and I try to recruit, all the time. And the number one reason I hear from women candidates that we're trying to get in, that would be brilliant, that would be so good for this country and for our parliament, they say, why would I want to subject myself to that? That testosterone-driven, terrible place to work and subject my family to watching me there every day. And it's a problem. First Past the Post isn't exclusive to that. Lots of places are not very nice. But for such a nice country as Canada, question period makes no sense for our culture. You're all nice people. Does anyone talk to a neighbor or their family in 35 second sound bites like we do in question period? 
where it is a pantomime of theater, and there is a zero-sum game. If you're winning, they're losing. And if they're winning, you're losing. And that zero-sum game gives us the results that we see time and time again. Where good people don't want to run. Good people don't want to present themselves because the abuse is so great. As was said, we have ranked 62nd in the world for women. Uh, and that is also not even nearly reflective enough of this country. There is no reason for this in this day and age. Now, we're, we're going to, without the aid of our wonderful technology, because who needs technology? We, if any of you have been to um, one of my uh, talks before, you've done this exercise, and we're gonna do it again, because at least one person in this room hasn't done it yet. And that qualifies for the need to repeat. So, uh, for this one, you, uh, you need to just have your arms free. If you have like a pen or a bag or something in your lap, you, you need to just have your arms free. And all you need to do, Oh, oh, some of you have seen it before, are already ahead of the game. Just fold your arms, please. Cross your arms. All right. All right. Good. Now, when uh, your arms are crossed, you too, Dick Proctor. Uh, when your arms are crossed, I'd like you to look at your arms and see which arm is up and which arm is down. You know what I'm saying? Like my left arm kind of tucks underneath and my right arm goes over top. Don't look at your neighbors. You're only going to confuse yourself. It really it doesn't help at all. Okay, great, everybody's good? Okay, good, let that go. Because you look like a very hostile crowd right now. <laughs> not falling asleep, but not happy. Okay, good. Uh, now, I'd like you to cross your arms again, but this time I'd like you to reverse it. The arm that was up goes down, the one that was down goes up. <laughs> can't remember how. <laughs> I, I can't help you. Okay, good. Everybody's settled in. Some have given up entirely. That is so discouraging. Okay, good. You can, you can drop that. Shake your arms out and uh, do that way one more time again. Last time. That, that way you just did it. The, the not usual way. Terry, take your time. You're good. Okay, great. What I'd like to know is, thank you. You can put that down now and make me feel more comfortable. Uh, when the very first time I asked you to fold your arms, what went through your minds? Nothing? If we, if, we were, if we were doing a little brain activity monitoring of this room, was there a lot of uh, defensiveness? There was a feeling of defensiveness. How, uh, how much thinking did you have to do about it before you folded your arms? None. How did it feel? Defensive? Comfortable? Natural. Great. Technical? Oh. Say again? Obedience. <laughs> Fold my arms right. Yes, sir. Okay. Why am I doing it? I don't know. He told me to. Um, great. When I asked you to do it the second time, the, the odd way, what went through your minds? Had to think about it? Who had to think about it a little bit? Okay. Um, how did it feel physically? Awkward, fine. Wrong? Wrong, okay. Uh, the second time you did it the weird way, how much thinking? A little bit easier? Some staying? So, some very um, unlucky students at the UCLA in California signed up, you know, the psych department? <laughs> 10 bucks, please come in. This is horrible that this happens, Abigail, by the way, at our finer institutions. Ten bucks for three hours. You know, you're a starving student, it makes sense. And what they did um, was have those poor young people fold and unfold their arms for three hours in, in alternating ways. What did they learn? What did the researchers learn? Nothing. <laughs> no, no, they, they learned something. How to make easy money. I don't know if I'd call it easy money. I, I'd weigh that. What did they learn? People can adapt. Uh huh. Say that again. Anger or frustration. Yes, there was some of that as well. The students, overwhelmingly, 85% of them that left that uh, study couldn't remember the way they came in folding their arms. And you'd say, there's no way. I know what's comfortable and I know what's uncomfortable. Now, 
There's going to come some point for some of you in the course of the next week where you'll be at the, the dentist, the bus stop. You're going to fold your arms for some reason. Then you're going to perform a subversive activity. <laughs> you're going to very quietly fold them the other way and no one's going to know except you that you are performing an experiment on yourself. What does this teach us about change? What does it say about humans and change? We don't like it. What else about change? It's possible, it gets easier with practice. Practice makes perfect. It gets easier and easier with practice. What else do we know about change? You can be brainwashed into it. You can be brainwashed into it. I'd like you all to clear your minds right now. No, I don't have that skill. This is true. The, the reason I like this exercise, and it's a small one, and it's a silly one, but it reminds us, particularly if um, we believe in change, and, and virtually every Canadian when polled and asked about change says, I'm open to change. I welcome change into my life. That is a common response when asked, because we think that's the right answer. But as a group, we're not. Right? I like the cup of coffee that I buy. I like how it tastes. I like the practice. I know what it's going to look like. You want me to change? When I shave in the morning, I start here. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I do, because it's easier. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. What we're talking about here today for a lot of Canadians is something they don't want to think about. They just want it to work. And they don't even know, oftentimes, that it's failing them, that it's failing us. 18 million votes cast in the last election. Nine million votes, half, went to nowhere, elected nobody. We have a member of parliament, Jack Harris, St. John's, won 47% of the vote in his riding and is not the MP for his riding. That happens. We have a number of members that didn't gain 30% of the vote in their riding, and they're the MP. It happens. It happens again and again and again. Vancouver Island, seven seats. Liberals gain 24% island-wide, conservatives 23, 22% island-wide. There are six NDP, one Green. Downtown Toronto, Toronto GTA, nothing but Liberals, even though parties gain 25, 30% of the vote who are not liberal. What do those voters do? Where do they look to? And can they get something better? So, let me uh, talk about, we, we mentioned the principles of the Electoral Reform Committee, which we had struck and has uh, been meeting in Ottawa. And let me tell you, there's no better place to be in the world than in 95% uh, humidity, Ottawa, on a nice 35 degree day, in a suit. That's how you really want to experience Ottawa. I recommend it to everybody. It's been awesome. And we have heard from virtually, not every, but almost every professor in the country who's got an opinion about this thing, and we're going to hear from some more as we hit the road. And what's been fascinating to me is that we've had this world tour, virtual world tour, talking to all these countries, and all these countries will tell us, what we do is not going to be perfect for you, you have to come up with your own way of doing things. But you have to come up with something better, because your system is very old and doesn't work. It's the wrong tool. Now. The committee is uh, about to hit the road. We're going to go to all provinces and territories. We're coming to Victoria, as Murray said, and Vancouver, right across the board. We have to finish basically all of our work by the middle of November and write a report submitted by December 1st. The government has promised to deliver legislation by May of next year. Elections Canada needs about two years advance notice on any new electoral system in order for it to work in our next election. We are under a serious, serious timeline. A serious constraint, some would say. Now, ultimately what this about is, uh, and how we do this, is about legitimacy. Initially, we had asked the government to strike a citizen's assembly, modeled more or less on what British Columbia and Ontario did. Because I had fears that the people, broadly speaking, wouldn't trust only politicians sitting around the table deciding on how politicians get elected. There's too much vested interest. There's too much bias. It's hard for all those groups to come to that consensus that we're aiming for. The government didn't choose that path. We're on this path that we're on right now, and we're going to do it as best as we can. And we are aiming for consensus, by the way. We have a little uh, joke around the committee table that when any of my conservative colleagues say the word referendum, we all have to drink. 
Um, because if nothing else, my friends from the blue team have been very consistent and persistent. And I will argue this, they have a legitimate case to make. Which is to say, and it's an easy thing to explain to people, this doesn't belong to Murray and I. It doesn't belong to the advocacy groups like Fairfoot or Lead Now, Broadway. It belongs to us. And how do us have a say? How do we get a final say on this? Now, what are the problems with referenda? Is that one of them is that the question you ask isn't always the answer that you get back. Once you set the referenda question out there like a boat, you have no more control over what voters are actually thinking. In British Columbia, we had the HST referendum. How much was it about the actual tax, and how much was it about Gordon Campbell, a referendum on him, or how he brought it in, right? And if you look at it fairly, and you ask people what they were actually voting on, it's a mix. It's not that pure question, there's no such thing. We have also asked the question of my friends from the Conservatives and others who are advocating, what question would you ask? Because that's important. We've all seen those referenda questions that are so convoluted and twisted that the voter isn't really sure what it is that they're voting for at the end of the day. The third point I would make, especially about a country like Canada, who's only held three referenda in our history, is that they're volatile for a country composed like we are. And, and Chantal Hebert, there's a really great exchange, if anyone watches the the, the national panel that she sits on with, uh, with uh, Coin, who's become, I can't believe I'm saying this, one of my favorite columnists, because he is on this. He is on this issue, like white on rice. And uh, one of the commentators, I think it was Althea Raj, said, well, you know, the, the, the government might keep the referendum around just so they can um, kill any proposal that they don't like. And Chantel actually got a little upset. She doesn't get angry too often. She said, this is not a cheap tool. This is something that if you apply to Canada, it has unknown consequences to it. And ask the people of the United Kingdom about what it is to go through a referendum. <laughs> what voters were voting on and what the results were out the other end in Ontario when they had a referendum, many of the voters who voted against the change to a new system described themselves as being in favor of a more proportional system. They just didn't understand what the question was being asked, so they voted against it in large numbers. So, you get accused of saying that the voters are ignorant or not intelligent. No, no. Referenda are easily corruptible. You can easily change what the terms of the referendum are without working too hard, and much of the work comes on those advocating for the change. It is much harder on that side of the ledger is on the status quo side. We know that for a fact. That has been proven on various questions put to communities over the many years. So, Without the unbelievable visuals that I prepared for you, I mean, these things make a Michael Jackson concert look like, eh. For those, I'm dating myself, really. Did I just, I just did sort of date myself a little. It was my first concert ever, Thriller. Boy, was that a great concert. I was about seven miles from the front of the stage, but all I could see was this shiny white glove waving up front, and that was, it, I burst into tears. I was 10 years old, it was really good. There's a, a number of main proposals that are starting to, to come up. And my intention, and I've declared this to my, my colleagues on the committee, is that we come up with a proposal that we suggest to the government. That we hear from Canadians, we hear from experts, but I will not happily leave this process with a list of five noble values. That, the, that we love democracy, and it should be fair, and awesome, and stuff. That, that will be a waste of money and time. I believe we can get to a consensus, and I believe that consensus should form around an actual concrete proposal that we can hang in the window and show Canadians and talk about what it would actually mean. Because people need to know what this means in their lives. That this affects all of our lives in the way that we vote. Now, a couple of systems that have come forward. Uh, STV is probably the one most familiar to those of us that are addicted to this terrible pathology. This is, uh, it, there's two main families, okay? Let's, let's back it up just a little bit, right? There is the majoritarian, winner-take-all family of voting systems, and there's only really two main ways to do that. One is first-past-the-post, the other is a ranked ballot. It's a first-past-the-post system with choices built into it. First, second, third, and fourth. Let me, let me speak to that system first. It sits in the majoritarian, it's a winner-take-all. 
Uh, it increases your amount of choice, so you don't just have to, you don't just get one X, you get a preference. We use it in um, party leadership races. You've seen this, right? Where, uh, probably more so before than the recent ones we've seen, but parties get uh, a number of candidates and you put your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice. What basically happens is that you're, if uh, the first choice of, of many people gets 50% or more, they win. That's it, it's over. But that rarely happens. Someone gets voted off the island. The last place person at each round gets chucked, and everybody who voted for that person as their first choice, that first choice vote disappears. Now their second choice is counted. And you count it all again. And in the old days, when we had rounds of voting at leadership races, everybody went back at the convention and it was high drama, and now they're off. Where do their, remember the delegates? Where are their delegates gonna go? And they all march across the hallway. And I was at the liberal convention that picked Stéphane Dion. And it was amazing, because it came down to Stéphane and Bob Ray and Michael Ignatieff. And the Ignatieff and the Ray camps realized, just before that vote, that Dion was coming up the middle. He was everybody's second choice. He was like a sentimental favorite. And the camps freaked out, started yelling at everybody in the room, including me, and I said, I'm not a liberal, I'm not voting, I'm just... <laughs> I said, we don't care, get over there! And I said, I'm not, I'm not listening to you. They were just so animated, and it was high drama, but, but the, uh, some people were disappointed. Stefan wasn't, because uh, it worked out really well. But that's a preferential ranking system. Uh, Australia uses it in their lower house. Their upper house, they use an SDV. And what's interesting in Australia is that it's the only place that, uh, there might be others, but it's one of the few countries where they use a proportional and a majoritarian system at the same time. And so you get to compare. And many, many more women, for example, get voted in under the proportional system, five times more. Uh, end up under the SDV system there, in that case, than they do under the ranked ballot system. This is, this is how it is. It doesn't take care of the issue of false majorities. False majorities are still relevant. It gives voters more choice, but not necessarily their first choice. It's like walking into an ice cream shop, and you say, gosh, chocolate. And they go, that's a really great choice, but you can't have it. And you go, okay, vanilla. And they go, nope. <laughs> Strawberry? And they go, yeah, that's your first choice. <laughs> Give me five dollars. And maybe, maybe you, you're stuck and you're wanting ice cream, so you take the strawberry, but just, it's ice cream. It's not what you really wanted. Um, are you gonna go back? <laughs> eh, maybe, no. Because you also sometimes uh, don't even know going into the ice cream shop whether you'll get chocolate or another strawberry. So it's one that uh, Mr. Trudeau has expressed some interest for. It. Um, if, if he's named any system, that's the one that he said he likes most. Um, but it's, you can tell it's not uh, necessarily what uh, much of the committee is. Wow. We, we, we got hacked, by the way. This is, this, this is what happened here. I'd like to tell the representatives from CSIS we're doing nothing untoward. You guys are amazing. Let's give a hand for our audiovisual people. Okay. So let's, let's flip through this. Um, no, let's not flip through this. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, there we go, there's the problem, there's that. Oh, here's a good thing. So, just to be fair about all those wasted votes, uh, they were wasted quite equally around the political spectrum. There was 25% there was of liberal votes that didn't elect a liberal, 30% of conservatives, uh, about 30% NDP, 7% bloc, six and a bit for Greeks. Those are people that voted for those parties and uh, they didn't win. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, here's what's called vote effort, or vote efficiency. You hear this quite a bit. In the last election, 30, if you take all the votes cast for a party and then uh, divide that by the number of MPs that were elected, this is what you get. So it shows how efficient a vote is, which is kind of interesting. You're talking about this a bit, Abigail, with, in terms of uh, concentration of your vote effort. 38,000, every 38,000 votes on average elected a liberal. Uh, another 20,000 it took to elect a conservative. And a further 20,000 more votes per NDP, MP, 82,000 votes to get you a block, and the winner, 603,000 votes to get one green MP. So 38,000 versus 603,000, you want to talk about distortions, that's a distortion.
that's a system that's not very responsive to what voters want. Huh? Because it, that's completely out of whack from my perspective. And there we are, 62nd in the world. That sounds great. Um, here's the promise. We need to know that when we cast the ballot, it counts. This is the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau. That when we vote, it matters. I'm proposing that we make every vote count. That the 2015 election will be the last federal election under first past the post. And new legislation by May of next year. So here's the committee, and this is kind of fun, um, because initially, when the government said, we're gonna start the process, it was taking some time, it was taking time, and we were getting a bit anxious, because we knew, tick tock, we knew we needed some time. They proposed an initial committee proposal that had um, majority of government seats on the committee. Why? Why did they do that? Because that's the way it works. It didn't matter that they got 39% of the vote, they got 55% of the seats in the House of Commons, and the committees are built on how the House of Commons looks. And one of our young MPs, Daniel Blakey, son of Bill Blakey, who was a longtime MP, sketched out, literally on the back of a House of Commons napkin for me, hey, why don't we make the committee look like how people voted? And I said, Daniel, that'll never work. You're crazy, you young kid, you. <laughs> and then it did. And so here's the committee. Uh, five liberals, one of them is the chair, three conservatives, two NDP, one green, and one block, all with voting rights. Every MP can vote. And so what does this mean in terms of making decisions? What does this mean? What's the implication of this table? It wins. It's proportional. And what does it mean in terms of to get a decision through this committee? What do you need? You need cooperation. You, can't, you just simply can't have it your own way. It doesn't work. It literally doesn't work. And the amount of uh, off-channel conversations that have been happening just around witness lists and travel schedule and proposals and different models that has been going on has been so encouraging to me. Having Minister Monsef come up to one of our town halls in Skeena was a good thing. And there should be more of it, not less. And we need models, and so there's a bit of pressure on this, because the House of Commons would look this way too under proportional systems, much like this. And we gotta show ourselves the ability to change our political culture, which is not a small thing, because we've had 150 years of one way of doing things, which is skewering the other person, bringing them down to bring yourself up. Okay. There's the committee's principles you've heard about, effective and legitimate system, it must engage voters, it must be accessible and inclusive, have integrity and local representation. That is what we are guided under. Next one's good. Here's the ranked ballot, I discussed that with you already, using the Australian lower house. I'm not sure of any other examples of the ranked ballot on a national level, I think that's it. Okay, let's flick it. Single transferable vote, everybody, I, I walked through this one, you had three ridings, you clump them together, you see how the yellow Smarties versus the blue Smarties in the first example, even though blue does okay, still doesn't produce any seats. Under an STV, which is of the proportional family, you get a blue seat because there's enough blue votes. Downside of STV for a country like Canada is you sometimes have to combine ridings. Ridings get big. I live in rural British Columbia. This is a concern for rural Canadians. I can tell you that for sure because they look at our riding right now and they say, what? Uh, the other major uh, concern is that accountability or that link can sometimes get a bit more tenuous if there's a group of MPs. Maybe, maybe not. That's debatable under STV systems. Uh, some countries say that exists, some countries say it doesn't. How it would apply in Canada? Uh, not sure. Used in a number of countries. Malta. Malta's really, I can tell you about Malta sometime. Okay, next slide. Hey, Malta's doing some funky stuff. Uh, mixed member proportional, you all know this, we had it explained. Attempting to make the, the vote count be reflected in the seat count, be reflected in the amount of power. This is about power. This is about having influence. This is about voters voting for something and having it represented in the House of Commons. That's what this is about. Okay. This is a model that came forward. This is the Kingsley model, and this is mocked up by a fair vote uh, in Alberta. This is what Alberta could look like. I like maps. I'm a map guy. I want to see how it's going to look and how it's going to affect my life. So it's a rural-urban proportional split. Here's Alberta with their rural seats mostly staying intact. Maybe growing a little bit, but not a ton. It's when you get to the urban environments where you take, say, Edmonton North, where there are four seats right now, 
And you take that boundary around the very outside edge of those four seats and you make it one seat. And you have four MPs come out of it in a proportional way. Rather than just uh, individual constituencies, which again, under first past the post, keeps skewing the results. So that if um, Surrey, you just wrap your arms right around Surrey and say, this is one rhino. And that even if parties just eke out another candidate in those four ridings as is happening right now, it wouldn't work that way. It's based on a percentage and maybe a transferable vote in those ridings. In addition to that, to make it further more proportional, there'd be a northern and a southern top-up seats. So whatever each of the parties got in southern Alberta, that percentage of vote that they got, they would uh, acquire an MP that way. Your ballot would be two. You would have one for your local candidate, I want so-and-so, and one for party. And that second tally is what gives you the proportional seats. Now, here's a, here's a, remember those choose your own adventure books? I loved them when I was a kid. You, you, open, you get to a place and it says, go to page 16 if you go down the stairs. Go to page, uh, maybe you didn't see these books. They were really popular in my school. <laughs> Electoral reform stuff is a lot of choose your own adventure. Which way do you want to go? If, if better gender representation, diversity, is the single most important issue, you would have, out of this system, what's called closed lists. Lists prepared by the parties. Ranked. And that proportional vote would start to pick off MPs. If the party is gaining three seats, the top three people on their list are now going to Parliament. The reason that gives you greater diversity is the parties tend to, what they call, zipper the lists. Man, woman, man, woman, man, woman. Okay? The downside is what? They're not directly elected. They're not directly elected, and they're constructed by the parties. Some people don't like it because it's more of a behind the scenes choice. Hmm? So, one proposal that's come forward, which I think is kind of interesting, is that you would take a region like southern Alberta and say, just for Suspend disbelief for a moment. Imagine the NDP, the Liberals, and the Conservatives all get 33% of the vote in Southern Alberta. <laughs> Dare to dream, or, or any combination of parties. But there's three seats available. Each of those parties would be uh, available to one seat. What you would do is take all the people that ran in that election, and the next most popular Liberal that didn't actually win in a straight vote, they become one of the proportional seats. They ran in one of the ridings, they came close, they didn't win, someone beat them they become the representative, so that the voters involved. That's a proposal that's come forward right now. All right, good. Yeah, I'll wrap it up. Okay, so the committee has a number of other things, and we'd be very curious about your comments on this, to consider. Mandatory voting. What is it? It is what it is. You must vote. Now, it means you must show up. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to vote for somebody. And there's exceptions made for people of faith or some other reason that don't vote. But everybody else have to vote, or else you get fined. $25 in Australia, I believe is the fine right now. 25 bucks, I think it's 25 bucks. So that's something we're meant to consider, voting age. The voting age is what right now in Canada? 18. The consideration is to lower it to 17 or 16. All right, all right, all right, all right. You can see it, we're stirring you now. Online voting. So, uh, government's quite hot to trot on this one right now. The idea that you'd be able to vote from your laptop, from your phone, you bank online, you shop online, people date online, why not vote online? Is what we're meant to look at as well. And so we've been asking those questions of other countries who have tried it, or tried it on small scales. Yeah, th this, is, this is good. This is, this is where the debate starts. Um, and you can see the choices being made. Uh, and the last one is about legitimacy. How do we legitimize what we're doing? As was argued by Fair Vote, I think very effectively, 63% or so of the people uh, casting votes voted for parties who promised change. Is that enough? Is that legitimate enough? We might be speaking to some of the converted in here because people outside of this room might not see that as legitimate because people don't like politicians. I've heard that. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I haven't had it verified. Uh, the referendum drum keeps getting hammered away on. Referendum, referendum, because it's easy to explain. It's got a credibility piece, which is that this system doesn't belong to the parties and the politicians, it belongs to people. They need a say. And some will argue, as my colleagues have argued, Justin Trudeau didn't win on this promise. 
He won on a whole bunch of other things. Which is that curious thing in politics. When you like a promise from a, a politician, you say, that's your mandate, you have to do it. When people don't like the promise being made, they say, you didn't get elected on that. You shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Perspective matters a lot in these things. Another proposal that's come forward is to run a couple of elections and then give people the choice, whether they want to return back or go ahead with it. The, uh, this is the last thing. The idea being, as we demonstrated a little bit with change, is that people resist change. As we talked about a bit before referendums, you often get an answer to a question you didn't ask, and there is a natural tendency not to want to change things. Because what will we hear from a lot of people? It ain't broke. What's the problem? Why are you in middle? Yeah, well, you gotta get that first conversation done first. Okay, I talked way too long, but we got through it. Thank you very much for listening. Can we have the lights on up here? I don't know about you, but I found that pretty inspiring, and I don't know about you, but it kept me awake most of the time. Maybe. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, so, it's your turn, and I'm glad to see people already lined up with the mic. We also have a roving mic. Is anybody, who's got the roving mic? There's Van there with the roving mic, and if those of you are uncomfortable coming forward, no problem, just put your hand up. I'll try to make sure I get a mix of, a match of the people both, uh, at both places. Uh, what I propose is, given the number of people and the interest, is we have two or three questions and I'll ask people to get a pencil out to all three of you and we'll make sure that we handle them in, that, in, in a, a group so we can get more of you heard. I'd really like you to please be, uh, uh, be willing to keep your questions short and it's not, not speeches so we can hear more people and, and have uh, more response from the panel. Now, I was asked if uh, Gary Holman, MLA, is here. Gary, are you here? Gary, I think I see you in the back. Gary, did you want to say a few words first uh, about what's happening in the province of British Columbia? Gary Holman is the opposition critic for electoral reform and the MLA for Saanich North and the Islands. Maybe you could just give us a tiny soupçon of what's happening provincially. See, uh, thank you, Marie. Um, uh, sorry for being a, a little bit late. I was at the uh, Pride uh, Parade on Salt Spring. Uh, 10,000 people, third largest Pride Parade in British Columbia. So that's why I'm a little bit late. Uh, just quickly, and uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian here, contrarian given I, I suspect most people aren't supportive of the referendum. So we as the official opposition have proposed to put electoral reform back on the table. But at this point, our view is because of the two referenda that we've had in British Columbia, which have produced somewhat contrary results, the last one going down 60% to 40%, um, and, and not necessarily for all the right reasons either. Uh, there, are, there are, the advocates say that the second referendum that failed so badly, uh, there was a reason for that, and, uh, and, I, and I agree with them. So I, I don't want to get into the, I think we can approach it in a way that we maximize the chances of a referendum succeeding here in British Columbia, including the voting threshold being 50% plus one, and we also believe that the, the question needs to be generic. Uh, Murray, just one other thing I want to mention for British Columbia, uh, and all of this is in place federally, which is the dire need for election finance reform right. in British Columbia. So we need to take... We need to take big money out of politics, the concerns about undue influence there. Political donations from corporations and unions are banned at the federal level, and that's what we as official opposition propose to do in British Columbia, as well as place a limit on personal donations to remove the concerns around big money affecting politics. All of that is in place federally, and that's where we need to go in British Columbia. Thank you. Thanks so much for the work you're doing. And Thank you. Nathan, uh, congratulations. On, on getting the, uh, the, uh, the committee to actually represent voter preferences in Canada. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. All righty. Yes, sir, you're first. Uh, uh, my name's Ken. A uh, couple of comments before I ask a question. I'm so pleased that consensus is the uh, objective of the uh, committee, and, and I'm even prepared to lower my expectations a bit so that going forward, will have nothing but improvement. Uh, that being provided, we can stay away from the referendum thing, which just proves first past the post is one-sided. 
has there been any discussion about the ability of the anti-reform people to be able to use PEI and the Constitution to disrail this whole thing. Sure. Okay, let's go. Um, okay. And then my second thing is, I noticed a total absence of any comment about the most undemocratic thing in Canada, the Senate. <laughs> Thanks so much. Freya. Oh, hi. Um, I like the idea of having a proportional system that separates the, um, the, the vote for your local representative from the party vote. I know so many people personally who had to make that choice. It's a, a, a source of great angst for a lot of people. So I like the idea of a two-vote system. The other thing is, um, I'm a little disappointed that the committee hasn't done any advertising. There is a void out there that's being filled with misinformation and all this talk of referenda. So I want to know when they're going to start advertising. For example, when and where is this meeting of the Electoral Reform Committee next week? Well, in fairness, that last one, we don't know yet, they yeah, haven't got the I venue, exactly. but you will find out on that one. Okay, any, with the roving mic, is there anybody in who wishes to use that, uh, uh, or should I go continue to go to this mic? Oh, but maybe you can go back one if you wouldn't mind, so we can make a bit of a mix here. That gentleman. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to hear that the committee is really starting to work, or is working as well as you're describing, Nathan. Um, I have to confess that I'm a recovering political scientist, and one of my concerns about a lot of the PR systems is that they uh, set the percentage for representation so low that when you get a very complex minority situation, you have very small groups of people who have incredibly large influence on how a coalition government comes together and how decisions are made. So my question is about, is the committee really looking at this? And have you looked at uh, the experience in other countries in terms of where you set that percentage so that you don't get real splintering uh, of parliament? Okay, now to the answers. Or attempt. So uh, let me let me start with the last first. This is about the floor, just so everybody understands that it, most proportional systems have a floor at which a party has to get a certain percentage of the national vote before they start to gain some of those proportional seats. Uh, mistakes have been made in the past where the floor was set at two percent or something very low, and you get this tail wagging the dog effect, where very very small parties in Israel, for example start to run Israel's entire foreign policy to, I would argue, sometimes disastrous results. The, we, the number get, gets thrown, we have discussed this, the number that gets thrown around is 5%. Um, some people have advocated for us to go higher. Part of the problem with that is that will, I would suspect, get interpreted if we just go to 7 or 10%. There's one particular party that rarely gets that threshold. Anyone want to name that party? Greens. And it might be seen by some, and it, it could be argued that way, that the committee was trying to, to skew the, 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 the system to keep Greens out. Others have argued that if that percentage was there and the floor was decent, and we had a good system, more people would vote their conscience and vote what they wanted and vote Green more often and get to the 10% threshold. But that's why five is thrown around quite a bit, is that it, it is a number used around the world. It may be too low, it may not. We'd have to do some modeling. Real quick, um, advertising. The minister has a $10 million budget. We have a, uh, almost no budget as the committee. We have a budget to travel. And it ain't cheap, by the way, because we're going to like a Callaway and stuff. Um, one of the things that we're urging the minister to do is start to prepare things that Canadians can actually see. Some of these basic sort of tools to understand what it is we're talking about. It hasn't happened yet, but I think it's coming. Constitutionally, we've, I've never seen this before, we had a, uh, every constitutional expert come in front of us and say what we're doing, as long as we don't change the, the proportion of seats coming out of the provinces, is entirely constitutional. We do not need to go to a constitutional uh, process with the provinces and territories in order to pass electoral reform. Unless you start to muck with PEI and how many seats they get in Quebec and how many seats they get as, as a proportion of the country. And that's what's baked into our Constitution. And unless someone wants to open up the Constitution, uh, we're not going to do that. So we're good on that. I think that was everything. That's it. Thanks. Yes. Heather. 
Uh, my question is coming from experience that I've had working with both Elections BC and Elections Canada working as the in Indigenous Liaison Officer. And so I wanted to uh, stress the goal of accessibility and having traveled the province, especially northern BC, and Nathan, you know this better than anybody, some of those ridings are enormous and indigenous communities really get shortchanged in terms of not only accessibility to voting, but also accessibility to the candidate. So. Uh, my emphasis here is whatever system is chosen, and I really hope it's a PR system, that there is really a diminishing of the idea of clustering ridings. I think it's a huge mistake, and it, it doesn't provide good accessibility. The second question I wanted to ask was about funding for Elections Canada. Let's remember that the Fair Elections Act, or the Unfair Elections Act, really did cut funding for the kind of work that I was doing, which was reaching out into communities and letting people know what their voting opportunities were. So I'm hoping that the committee has an opportunity in there to look at, if we're going to change the system, let's restore the funding for Elections Canada so that we can really make the system work. Thank you. Great. I saw Ed Broadbent, and I was very impressed with uh, Ed Broadbent's uh, comments about the need for electoral reform. Uh, something, well, he was talking about the multi-member uh, proportional representation system. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. <laughs> and what I noticed... Here you go. Yeah. What I noticed was that it was simplified, and I wanted to know, okay, if you have a big region and the party is going to have some members that it's going to put forward, how does the, how do the electorate actually get a say into how those people and who those people are that are going to be representing them? Thanks. Thank you. Roving mic time. Anybody got a question who doesn't want to get up? Yes. Roving mic person over there. Uh, hi. Um, I'm a teacher here in Victoria and I teach social studies. Uh, social studies grade 11 actually. And uh, obviously we talk about the electoral systems in our curriculum and students who are 16 years old are listening, uh, I hope. <laughs> And hopefully I, I don't have to teach about the first-past-the-post system as our current system uh, again. And so, but my question is more to do with the voting age um, that Nathan brought up. Um, in this round of committee discussions, how much conversation has there been? Um, what's your hunch? Are we possibly going to see a change in our voting age in Canada? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, have a go. Well, I'll take the MMP's question. So the reason why you might have been confused is because the multi-member proportional can work in different ways. And so one of the ways it works is you have a ballot. Uh, the one part of the ballot just has uh, the names of the candidates, much like our ballots, and you choose one of them. And then you have a second question, and those have the parties, and you choose one of those. Okay? Some of these systems uh, turn out that uh, we just look at who is elected mu exactly in the way that we would look at who is elected in our system. The candidate that wins, wins the, wins the riding. But the gap between, let's say, the number of votes the party got and the number of, vote, and the number of people who end up in Parliament, the gap between, as I said, this time with the New Democrats getting 13% of the seats and 20% of the vote, that 7% is made up by the party lists. That's one way. Another way in which it can work is that you can have a parliament divided into those people who are from the lists and those people who are elected kind of in a first-past-the-post majoritarian way. There's a number of different ways in which it can work. Uh, quickly on the age uh, question. There's a lot of fear, actually, that we've encountered. We, I don't think the, I can't guess which way the committee is going. Um, the interesting examples around the world: there are some countries that they lower the voting age to 16 if you have a job. 
you can vote, which presents other complexities that I don't think we should entertain. Uh, Scotland lowered the voting age during their referendum question about whether to leave the United Kingdom to 16. And there was great fear that the young people would all vote to leave. And the exit polling and the polling showed that they in fact didn't. So there's a fear as to what young people think. Very quickly, in my first year, uh, I supported a liberal bill, as did a conservative in a block, to lower the voting age to 16. We went across the country having town halls, mostly with high school students. And I can still remember a young woman coming up to the mic in Edmonton. And she said, this is a terrible idea. I hate it. And we said, okay. She said, because I am 16. If there was an election right now, I would have to study each of the candidates. I would have to read all of the platforms. And I would have to make a very serious decision about my future. And that's a lot of stress. <laughs> and the four of us on stage were looking at each other and saying, you just made an argument against uh, your position. You made an argument for lowering the voting age. Uh, I'm becoming more and more inclined towards it, although there is a lot of resistance. There really is. And it's either fear of remembering what we were like when we were 16, or looking at a 16-year-old in our lives and saying, oh my gosh, we can't offer them that. But they are the most connected, uh, informed generation in history. And they're a lot smarter than us. Apparently. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm speaking as an autistic, which is one of the groups that are most horribly underrepresented in Canadian society, despite the fact that our rates are growing. My question is, this, this, uh, this group has a survey going around, one of which of the sections is additional comments, anything that the committee might need to know. If my understanding correctly is that the, uh, the federal elections and the provincial elections are effectively a poll as to who we're putting in power. Why is there no comment section for, not, for, uh, for anonymous comments, so this way the MPs and the Elections Canada can have uh, constant feedback about what people are thinking when they're voting, and also possibly possible ways to change the system. If we want to do a referendum, why not have not only yes or no, but why you're voting yes or no? My second comment is that um, I've also posted a, uh, I've also had a paper recently published which addresses a large number of the issues listed here, as well as some others to Canadian uh, politics. Murray, I believe you have a copy of that paper. If you could pass a copy to the other three through your office at a later time, as well as my further uh, amended proposal on uh, putting these comment sections on the ballots. And if anyone wants to know more, feel free to find me outside after the show. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the committee's mandate says its consultation agenda must focus on, quote, strengthening the inclusion of all Canadians in our diverse society. Uh, I was wondering if Nathan could comment on how the committee is engaging low-income and homeless Canadians as part of its consultation process. Thank you. Good question. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, it's very likely that the result of proportional representation will be a minority government. Now, I think a minority government can be very good, but our tradition in Canada is that it's second best, and it lasts two years. Uh, so I want, my question is, are you doing anything about educating the Canadian people and the politicians about how to run on minority government. Thanks. Okay, one more, and then we'll go to the go to the panelists. Yes, please. Uh, this question is very hypothetical. Uh, if 16-year-olds were given the right to vote, would it then follow that they would have the duty to fight for their country? Aha. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> duty to fight for their country. Do you want to start? Or right, maybe Terry, you ready? Do you wish to jump in on this one? Okay. I. Okay. <laughs> Looks like you got it, buddy. Okay, Abigail, can you, can you do it? Great. I mean, just on the minority government, the proportional representation giving minority government, I, I actually don't think that Canada is going to go for a pure proportional uh, system. And if we look at the systems that are mixed, proportional and first past the post, which is the multi-member proportional, which is probably the kind of proportional system we would end up going for. Those systems are incredibly stable. Uh, in fact, the huge success story in the history of electoral reform, the recent history of electoral reform, is New Zealand that went from a system that was first past the post in 1996, changed to multi-member proportional, did it through a referendum, interesting enough, three referendums, uh, and it was a really smart way of doing referendums. So if we're stuck with referendums, it's a t worth taking a look at what New Zealand did. And what they have is very proportional, it, it, completely proportional system, 
based on multi-member proportional. They also have stable governments. They, have, they don't have a huge spike in their participation rates. They don't have massively more women in their parliaments, but they do have a lot of the things that we're looking for. And I think that what that system shows really, really vividly is that uh, the electoral system is not a magic bullet here. That you have to have so much more going on uh, in order to get the kind of inclusive representation, someone mentioned homelessness, you have to have parties who are willing to put those people up. And uh, parties that are willing to put women up. And parties that are willing to put ethnic uh, minorities up. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter if you have a straight proportional system, you are not going to get more inclusive representation. Um, to the, the comment idea, I'll very much want to read what uh, you give to Murray. It's an interesting idea. But this is what we're looking for, is as we innovate, when we're going to open up the hood and get into our electoral system, this is the great chance to do some innovative things like giving voters another way to express themselves. Uh, in terms of low-income uh, homeless folks, what we've asked the uh, committee to do is that when we go across the country, uh, to at least invite, if not folks that are dealing with life on the street, but the advocates who are working with people who are uh, having life on the street is to make sure that whatever we come up with uh, becomes more accessible. And let me just make a little pitch for coalition and cooperative government. That I think last time this thing really uh, was, um, how could we say this? It was, it was presented by the government as somehow unconstitutional or unethical. I like the idea of sharing power. I don't think any one party has all the ideas and solutions. To the challenges and we just we just gotta go I think we gotta go right at this because in the last 20 elections in Canada under first past the post we've had nine minority governments and under our system there's actually an incentive to bring those governments down whereas under proportional systems the incentive is to keep the government going because there's no reason to bring the government down if it's going to give you the same results again and some of our most enduring and progressive legislation has come out of minority governments right so I want to make a little defense Employment insurance, health care, the flag, a whole bunch of really good things came out of when parliaments had to work between the parties together on an idea that they eventually had to share together. And I think that's very much a Canadian value that we should uh, present. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, Marin. Uh, yes, I, I'm a member of Fair Vote Canada and uh, the Victoria Group. And one of the reasons I've been strongly supportive of proportional rep, and I'm following Terry, who who used her personal examples, is that in where there is proportional rep, there is greater equality. And that has been measured over and over again by um, political scientists. I have two questions. One is for Murray. Um, when we talk about mixed member proportionality, we talk about a list of, of uh, people that are in a party. How is that list going to be formed? And the second question I have is for the audience. If you like proportional representation, do you know that you can get this postcard from Fair Vote, out, we're out there, uh, that you can sign and send to the committee? Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Yes, sir. We're going to do a couple, we're going to do the same thing if we can. Get through yeah. this list here, by the way, we've got to go, we'll leave around five. I'm going to get someone on the roving mic, but then we'll finish this list of people who are here. And then, by the way, I want to make clear that we're going to stay around at the front for a couple minutes. If some of you who aren't anxious to go to the mic would like to just talk one-on-one -on -one with some of the panelists, we'll arrange that as well. Yes, sir. Just as a decide, Mr. Collins, uh, comments about how well majority governments have worked. I would remind him that those uh, minority governments were elected under the majority system we have now. One could argue that's was the system was working. But I have a question about referendum. Uh, uh, my own personal view is that it's such a significant change that I think that, that uh, parliamentarians should not be making that change on their own. I think that it should be put to a referendum. But my question is when I look at your presentation and the timeline that you've outlined for putting in place a new electoral system for the next election, um, given the time that it would take in order to um, do all of the things that you've described, is it even realistic to consider a referendum? Is it, is it um, uh, worthwhile putting that up 
as a consideration. Right. Is it a real consideration given those timelines? Good question. Okay, we'll come to that. Excellent. Yes, sir. Um, my, my question also touches on the referendum point. Um, there, there's a lot of things, obviously, that the committee is discussing and what sort of system is going to be proposed and whether or not it's going to go to referendum and all, all these different matters. Um, but ultimately, to me, I don't think that the question of which system and whether a referendum or when a referendum happens are really independent questions. As we saw with the BC STV stuff, uh, the system, specific system that's proposed in a referendum might have a real impact on the result. And I prefer to see even a compromise, a more incremental change, something that's not the perfect system that maybe we would love to have 50 years from now um, proposed if it had a better chance of actually uh, passing in a referendum. Okay, um, got and I, 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 That's I good. would just like to end with a plea as a software developer, someone who loves online banking and filing my taxes electronically and all of those things, please don't do online voting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, anybody with the roving mic? Where's our roving mic person? Okay, yes, sir. A um, little technical question here. Uh, when it comes to the floor that um, uh, parties have to meet when you're talking about five, six, or seven percent, uh, is is that just a national, or can that be a pro province by province um, thing? Okay, here we go. Hope to the panel. Abigail or Terry? Yeah, I guess on the issue of the referendum. I mean, I, that's the thing that I've been really uh, worried about. Listening to the committee and hearing the conservatives over and over and over, it's about the only thing that raised. And, you know, my answer to myself is that um, at the most I would favor a validating referendum two elections later, after we've had a chance to test out the system. And I think we can argue that the combination of these 13 electoral reform processes that have gone on, which every one of them has recommended a form of PR, the fact that we have this proportional committee, the fact that it's going around the country, it's instituted an online survey for us to fill out, you know, I think um, that that's sufficient because I just feel that if we go to a referendum in, in the near future, it will be hijacked. That's what we've seen repeatedly with the provincial uh, referendum. Thank you. Just don't want to see it. Any comments? Well, I was just going to say, you know, it, Again, I, I, I was fascinated with the New Zealand system because what they did is they had a referendum, a non-binding referendum in 1993. They asked people two questions. Number one, do you want to change the electoral system? And number two, which of these four do you favor? Completely non-binding. They got 70% of people choosing MMP and they got 70, 80% of people saying they want to change. Then they had their commission. Then they came up with this is how uh, an MMP system that they advertised. They had another referendum, this time binding. They said, do you want that MMP system or do you want first past the post, the old system? People roundly endorsed the change. And then, years later after two elections, they said, do you want to go back? And so three referendums, I don't know if we have the time for three referendums. <laughs> I don't know if we have the time for those two. It is a fresh process, isn't it? It, 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 okay, um, New Zealand has, is, a, is an amazing example, and they actually sort of backed their way into this whole process. It was during a campaign, and one of the party leaders got up at a, a, a press event and promised to hold a referendum by mistake. It wasn't actually the party platform. And then the other party that was running said, oh yes, us too, and then they got into a referendum cycle. Um, New Zealand holds a referendum every two years or so, on average, over the last 15 years. They, they hold a lot of them. BC likes them too. I would, I would just hesitate a bit for Canada as a whole. Again, back to my, we don't, do we have time? That's the question. To hold a referendum, bring a new system in place, and then have it for the, and still meet Mr. Trudeau's commitment? No. I don't believe we do, to be frank. Uh, especially if any system recommends changing boundaries and all that. Referendums cost about 300, 350 million dollars in this country. So one has to be a bit cognizant, but more as that plus the political fallout. On the online voting, we've heard pretty convincing, sorry? Use the Senate money. Use the Senate money. Oh, <laughs> gladly, sir. Um, on online, very quickly, the, the overwhelming evidence that we've heard is this is a risk versus benefit question. What kind of benefit do you get from allowing people? Do you get more young people and that type of thing? 
Um, the system has to be 100% foolproof. It cannot be hackable, it cannot be crashable, it cannot have a blip, glitch, anything, anywhere once. And all of the computer folks that have come to us have said no such system exists. Every uh, data system has had a breach, banking, whatever. Uh, if you have an election in which there is a breach of any kind, the election is void. And you have to do it again. So it seems like the overwhelming evidence is pointing us away from online voting so far. But we're about to go out on the public tour and we'll hear from Canadians. The list question, I just talked about this a bit before. Uh, it's either a party controlled list where the parties put forward candidates preferenced or the list is constructed another way. Some countries, voters get to vote people onto the list. You're given a bunch of candidates and you can vote someone onto a party list. Other places have used the system by which that, that candidate from a party who didn't win but came close, they become the first person on the list for that party so that the voters involved that way. The, one of the worries with lists is you can sometimes end up with a list of 60 or 70 people on your ballot. Uh, which it goes back to the simplicity question. A lot of voters are going to look at a ballot like that and say, no way, it's too complicated. Okay, this is the last group of questioners for our panel. Hi, uh, I just thought this would be a good time to ask, what are your thoughts on getting private money out of politics altogether and going to a system of 100% funding for political parties and elections? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Um, uh, also, uh, Nathan, you had mentioned earlier that uh, elections are about how we allocate power. And I think a lot of people agree with that. And I think there's uh, inherent skepticism when we say that politicians get to decide how we allocate power. And I think that's part of the concern why people want a referendum. Um, the, the federal liberals, they have a mandate to end first past the post, but they don't necessarily have a mandate to determine what is the change. They didn't, they didn't campaign on it. So I'm wondering if there's a way that we can have a referendum where we say your committee comes up with two or three proposals and then Canadians get to decide what is best for them. Okay, look, I know people are beginning to leave, so I'd like to try to make you, if you may be the last panel and search, you could come up and talk informally, I'd prefer that. Yes. Thanks, Murray. Um, I have long been a supporter of the mixed member proportional, and there, when I talk to friends and neighbors about that, they have two issues that always come up. One is the list, and you've, partially, you've addressed that somewhat this afternoon. The other one, which I haven't heard, is what do those people that don't represent constituencies actually do? What are they going to do in Ottawa? Are they second-class MPs? Uh, what are their duties and responsibilities? In a perfect world, we'd, we'd get rid of the Senate and probably put those people in there. But short of that, how is it going That's to That's a really great question on which to end. So uh, who wants to go first? Terry, do you want to answer that? Or? Um, well, on, the second issue, class on the system. issue of 100% funding for elections, I totally support that. I think that would be wonderful. I don't know how realistic it is, but I really support it. And from my listening to all of the committee hearings so far, the issue of so-called second class MPs, you know, using a proportional system is not an issue. Um, that they are valued equally and you work as a team and the work is divvied up. Even those who are on the list are responsible still to their, their local, uh, local constituents. And it's a team effort, which I think is a, a lot better than everything being uh, resting on one person. Right. Have a good one. Oh, uh, just on the proportional concern that someone had, I, I think that's right. I think that a lot of the systems that have mixed member proportional, there is a worry that there are two classes of MP, those that are actually elected in, in constituencies and those that come from the lists. Having said that, um, geography is not the only kind of representation that the, a contemporary society needs. And so sometimes those MPs that are wedded to their constituency, as important as that role is, and I think that it's hugely important in Canada, it's not, it doesn't reflect all of the concerns, it doesn't get at all of the issues, it actually skews things in a way that there are other issues that are non-geographic and it's great to have spokespeople those issues as well. Last word, David. The, uh, the list MPs, uh, the, we have been asking the countries that have them, are there two classes of MPs? The evidence has been overwhelmingly no. That voters, when polled, see them as equally valuable and recognized as people. Uh, under most of the systems I've seen, those are done at a very regional level. 
So you'd have a list MP from Southern Vancouver Island, and there'd be another one for Northern Vancouver Island. They're still attached somewhat to geography, but I think Abigail makes a good point that if you're entirely that way, which is what our system is now, sometimes you miss the national picture. Uh, on the 100% public financing, I think Mr. Harper was very effective at arguing against this, somehow about subsidizing politicians and taxpayers, which we already do anyways. They even do it in the United States, they have public financing. So uh, if a place that written with money understands the role, uh, I think that's something that we need to look at more. Whether 100% or I'm not sure, and the very last thing, interesting idea about a referendum in which there was choices presented to voters um, it would probably still not be possible to do such a referendum and bring that new system into place prior to the next election. Maybe, but we'd have to look at it. It takes six months to ramp up to a referendum in Canada, just to hold it. And then you, so time is a price of concern. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say to all of you, thank you so much for coming out. I hope you were inspired and I hope you learned things and you're uh, inspired enough to can keep contributing to this process. It's so critical to our democracy. I want to ask you to fill out those uh, surveys if you haven't done so on your way out. We'll be analyzing those and reading what you have to say. And thank you to our panelists, Terry, Abigail and Nathan for your very, very, I think, thoughtful remarks. Thank you for your excellent questions. Thanks to my team and my volunteers for putting this on. I really appreciate it. Thank you.